and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is your Reverend, Faith and Current Affairs. The Reverend Faith and Current Affairs to Church of England Revs talking about all the big issues of the day. Me, Jamie Franklin and Daniel French today. Daniel, how art thou? I'm, I'm, I'm fine, actually. Um, it's my wedding anniversary today. So, oh. so we've been uh, married 21 years. Wow, congratulations. Mm. Yeah. La tente va vite, as they say in France. Yeah, it's um, zoomed, zoomed by. One minute you're at the aisle waiting, and the next minute, two teenage kids doing taxi a dad. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> are, you, are you managing to do anything special today? I think we're going to go out. We've we've had a coffee out um, in a nice cafe just after lunch, and then we're just going to go um, somewhere out tonight. So yeah. All right. So what to a restaurant? Yeah. Where, where are you going? Tell us. I think there's a new Turkish restaurant in Kingsbridge, so we're going we're gonna to give that a go. That sounds nice. So Yeah, it does, doesn't it? I'm, I'm, I'm a very carnivorous sort of person. Yeah, meat, yeah, of course. meat, meat and meat. So, of um, so Turkish, that would be stuff like, you know, kebabs and sort of mm. a lot of, um, you know, I'm, still, I'm thinking meat on skewers with, yeah. with <laughs> and mm. is that the kind of thing? Uh, you mm. know, I yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I'd like to get into Turkish food, but... Mm. I don't know. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm not cultured enough. Yeah, there aren't many that round here because you know, so ten miles away from here, north, you've got Totnes, which is the sort of vegan veggie capital of Britain. Yeah. So, um, you know, actually, the Indians and the Turkish restaurants that that are are very good, you know, because they're they're catering to a huge number of people around here who. Yeah. uh, I can imagine. Desperately looking for an alternative to plant based. Plant-based, plant-based nonsense, <laughs> ideologically driven diets. Um, yeah, we've got we've got a really nice Indian. That I mean, you know, I like I like the occasional Indian. You know, I, I I'm um, disciplined in terms of my diet, but that's you know, it gives it it gives it the extra sort of um, free son of enjoyment mm. when it's only once in a while, doesn't it? But I hope you have a nice evening. Daniel, mm. um, thanks very much. Congratulations on twenty-one years. That's, twenty-one years—that's years, great, isn't it? Isn't it? It's a—it's—it's uh, mm. it's what we—it's what we like to see. You know, mm. faithfulness in marriage, commitment, taking a vow seriously. So, well done, Daniel. Well done. It's good stuff. Good stuff. Um, yeah, I'm uh, I'm preparing for uh, Holy Week. I'm doing all the preaching in Holy Week at our church. And uh, I am I am organised, and it's going to be okay. But I think I underestimated how long it would take me to write. So I have to yeah, write seven, a lot, isn't seven, it? Seven sermons for seven mm. days in a row. I think I underestimated it. I just thought, oh well, it'd be okay. I'll leave about a month. But actually, a month to do an extra seven sermons is not actually that that long. So you, you must put them all together into like a, a booklet or something. Um, I, I've well, I've done that in good. the past, and pe- people will kind of um, can you know buy it afterwards or for <laughs> parish funds yeah. um because because if it create if it sort of forms one corpus of mm. stuff over holy week that, that's quite kind of in-house published i mean we've got a in our parish down the road we've got a really decent printer so we can put out booklets and things yeah, yeah. easy i don't know if you've got that but it's um yeah people yeah. will kind of retrospectively say oh well, i'll put a you know a quid in the plate for Jamie's yeah. sons. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, it'd have to be good enough for people to want to revisit first. Um, but, you I'm know, I'm sure we'll, they will be. Well, sure we'll won't. see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. I'm focusing on the on the um, Christ, um, the, the theme of Christ emptying himself mm-hmm. and seeing that reflected in the, the various readings that lead up to Easter. So I'm trying to sort of focus on that and then contrast it when I when I write eventually the, the one for the Easter vigil, contrast all that kind of you know that sort of descent as it were with the with the joy of the resurrection so that's kind of the the way i'm seeing it um that's the kind of shape uh, but it's interesting isn't it writing sorry for people who are not interested mm. in in what it's like to write a sermon but normally when you write a sermon it's just a standalone thing but when you know you're doing seven days in a row it's almost yeah. like you can sort of get into a flow with it and you don't feel the kind of pressure to in- include everything that you'd include in a normal sermon so it's almost like yeah sort of flow one one of them moves onto another and and it can feel a bit more like a kind of narrative and like a story mm. where you're sort of um well, you're taking parishioners in a in a way you're taking them into a sort of retreat during holy week you know, yeah that they can 
uh, that they're getting something every day, and um, and that's kind of different experience for them, for them, and it could be quite an intense yeah. experience with a preacher. By you know, on Monday, Thursday, you might be feeling a bit whacked by it, but um, yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think that's a, it's, it's a very good thing to it's a very good thing to do. It's funny, isn't it, how general public tend to think that Christmas is busy time of the your year, Vicar, and actually emotionally, yeah, I find Holy Week is is a real marathon. It, you know, in in the best sense of the words, but you know, you are by Easter Day, you no, you, yeah. you are a bit knackered yeah. and expensed. Yeah, and, it's, um, yeah it's, it, there's no comparison. I mean, I, I, obviously, I've only been ordained. For a few years but there's no comparison you know christmas is just well it's not, you hardly even do anything extra what do you do i mean it depends doesn't it lots of people have loads of carol services to mm. be fair and we we have one because we've got one church but it's nothing compared to holy week and also with the with the emotional intensity of lent before mm. it as well um it is it is oh, it's, it's, I, it's, I find it, the yeah. nice thing about the, the thing that contrasts psychologically for us is well speaking of myself as a as a as a preacher and priest you know is that um at the end of Christmas, by, in, by the end of Christmas Day, I'm I'm feeling kind of at my lowest ebb. You know, you've, <laughs> you've given it all. You've probably been up early. You know, yeah. and you were you were you were up late the night before. Like right? for you know, yeah. you've got there's this whole sort of particularly this English thing of you know Christmas is pretty much finished on Christmas Day, and and you want to carry on with twelve days of Christmas. Whereas I, I find with with Easter, there is this sense. I mean, a just in the environment, this, that you know we are coming into warmer, a warmer mm. climate. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, that great message of Christ has risen, which I know is in you know every day for the Christian. But I, I feel you end up on this high. Yeah. You know, like 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 you've done the marathon run and and you've you've broken through the tape. Yeah. Uh, and there's this ex this exhilaration. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you feel like you're really living it, don't you? It's yeah. you're, you're embodying it somehow. Uh, everything's kind of on the up and the up. Whereas it, yeah. when Christmas finishes, you, you've still got this period of winter to mm. to go into, and probably the worst of the winter. Mm. And there's that, and you know, everything's been opened, everything's been done. You're feeling bloated because you've had a wonderful Christmas meal. Yeah, uh, yeah. and you're watching people on telly saying, "Oh, Christmas is over now. We can have the January sales." You know, it's yeah. psychologically. Oh. I, I find a bit depressing. Um, yeah, it is. It Easter is, it? is it is really my buzziest day. Mm, yeah, Easter's a great day, isn't it? Get your eggs out, have your lamb. Mm. Lovely time. Well, listen, Daniel, we are going to talk about the news, aren't we, and all the stuff that's going on out there in the in the world. Um, I'm looking forward to that, and um, you know, I hope I hope this has been an interesting insight into life as a vicar. Uh, for people who are interested, you know, lots of people listen to this and we still talk about these things and you're still listening. So you must find it reasonably interesting. So, you know, apologies if you didn't. Anyway, we're going to um, just do our scripture reading. We always like to start with a bit of scripture just to frame the conversation. Sometimes it ends up, you know, it ends up being a link between the scripture and the stuff we talk about. Sometimes mm -hmm. not. Um, so we'll see. We're just reading through little passages from the book of Philippians, which is a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to a church in Philippi. And uh, today we're going to read um, from chapter 3, verse 12 uh, to uh, verse 16. And Paul has just been talking about the way that he wants his life to be characterized by faith and pressing on to know the Lord Jesus. And as he says, mm -hmm. the power of his resurrection. So he's been talking about his ambition, what he wants, which is really to be um, united within himself in his pursuit of Christ. And that's the kind of context of this these verses coming up so um we'll say the lord's prayer and then we'll we'll read this um daniel do you want to read it i'll do the lord's prayer. yeah i'll, re I'll read it and you do yeah. the lord's you do the lord's prayer yeah i will okay so um uh, invite people who are listening or watching to uh, pray with us if you'd like to as we pray the prayer that jesus taught us so let us pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Mm. So uh, chapter 3, verses 12 to 16. Mm-hmm. 
not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made it his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. Thank you, Daniel. It's a beautiful passage. And mm. I really, um, I think the book of Philippians is the, the book that's meant the most to me out of all, certainly out of all Paul's letters, but I think out of the whole uh, New Testament, really, it just seems to be filled with so many sort of mountaintop moments. And this is, you know, I think this is one of them, this beautiful verse. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal uh, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know, when you consider the um, the past, you know, Paul's past his sort of realization, you know, the the original Damascus Road experience where he realizes that the past has been a, a, a huge mistake and that his whole life needs to change. And that really, you know, as he says in the in the previous passage, he now considers those things which he cared about so much. He considers them as worthless, as as dung, as useless. And so he's got to forget all about, about all of that and press on towards the future, towards the the positive thing that now animates his existence. And I think we all feel like that a lot of the time, you know, that we've wasted time, we've wasted part of our lives, we've perhaps fallen into sin, we've done things we regret. And part of the exhortation here from the Apostle Paul is that if those things hold us back, as they inevitably do, we have to forget about them and we have to move forward, we have to move beyond them. Now, it's not to say that memory memory is really interesting the way it's spoken about in scripture because it's not all like this because we're exhorted you know over and over again in the psalms and in many other places to remember the good deeds the the works of the lord his faithfulness to us and remember the 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 things like that which which help but with things which just hold us back and drag us back uh, we have to forget about those things and press on so it's not just about trying to sort of erase our memories but it's actually about fixing our eyes on the goal, which is to to know Christ and to, to grow in likeness to him. So I find that mm. to be a beautiful passage, you know, when thinking about those kind of things to do with regret. And it isn't the, I think the message of the prize is so important mm. uh, for, our, for our generation. You know, for many of our listeners, um, I think it would be fair to say who maybe have awakened to the world, to a troubled world. Mm, yeah. uh, and, You know, there's something to be said for 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 having your eyes open to the way things are, mm. but there's also a danger in that of losing the prize, mm. uh, of being so overwhelmed by all the troubles of the world and uh, and feeling that you're just sort of drowning in the system and yeah, that you forget that Christianity offers this incredible prize that is Christ Himself, mm. and um, you know, here's. Paul, who has been, who is and has been a prisoner, uh, incarcerated, uh, possibly towards the end of his ministry, mm. yeah, having this great vision of uh, of the greater things. You know, I, I, you know, I think it's, it's it's easy to be overwhelmed by everything that's in the news today, mm. and yes, it's in, in in many ways it is better to be you know, taking something of the red pill and understanding and, and seeing the world in a more nuanced way rather than just living in, in blissful ignorance. Mm. But the danger is losing the prize. Yeah, yeah. You know? and, and, you know, the, the God is infinitely bigger than, than all our problems. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think there's a wonderful humility here in what the Apostle mm. Paul says as well, you know, because he's obviously... He's he's lived a, 
a radical and faithful Christian life for so many years enacting his ministry. But then he also says, you know, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on, you know, so it's coming from a place of yeah. a, real, a realistic view of the past an inspirational view of, of, of longing for and, and pursuing Christ. But at the same time, it's coming from a place of self-knowledge and, mm-hmm. and humility that he recognizes within himself that, He's got to keep going, you know, and that he he hasn't obtained this. Um, I just think it's a it's a very um it's a very inspirational passage that that speaks to me very deeply. And I think you're quite right, Daniel. It's it's we can we can so easily be overwhelmed, can't we? Many people have felt that over the last few years. Um, overwhelmed yeah. with stuff in the news, overwhelmed just with the stress of every everyday life, and it's that that challenge, isn't it? To, mm. to live and there is a, there's a, there's a kind of so- spiritual psychological sense of pressing on having you mm. know you have to kind of work at this yes sometimes to uh, it, to allow that good news to continue to to inform and percolate through your life you know yeah. um, it, it would be so easy wouldn't it to to let these things kind of dominate our world vision yeah. and yeah. i'm sort of showing up your for iPhone, listeners yeah. here an iphone you know yeah. just to be existing on um our in our own bad news bubble of social media and it's just um yeah uh yeah it's the athletic metaphor isn't it which he mm. uses elsewhere as well you know straining forward to what lies ahead mm. to towards the prize um and you you said earlier you were talking about lent as almost like a lent and holy week being like a, a sort of marathon but the apostle paul uses that kind of language mm. like it's, it is like you know that's the metaphor it's it's uh mm. It it takes effort, mm. it takes discipline, it takes concentration, it oh. takes perseverance. You know, it's not just it's not just handed to you on a plate. So there's that as well. No, I was just letting the dog out. Yeah, no, that's okay. I saw I saw you letting your dog out. That's fine. I, we're all we're all dog lovers here. But we should probably because we're we we've got um we've got a certain time that you need to leave and I think do some mm. kind of taxi for dad stuff, don't you? Um in it t- in t- a is the way. Um <laughs> so the let's, current paradigm taxi. Yeah, absolutely. Well, speaking of uh, speaking of tiring things, let's let's begin uh, with our news roundup today by talking about this uh, mad Oxfam inclusive language guide. Have you have you come mm. across this, Daniel? Um, in your in your reading, well, I, I've seen reference to it, but I, I don't know. You know, who on earth has downloaded this and uh, actually looked at it? It's a it's a ninety two page inclusivity guide, um, which calls English quote the language of a colonizing uh, uh, nation, colonizing nation. Well, we we were a colonizing nation, so yeah. I suppose that is our language. But is our language characterized by that? I don't know. The 92 page report warns against colonial phrases such as, quote, headquarters. Interesting. I don't really see what's what's particularly colonial about that. Suggests local. The word local may be offensive and says the word people uh, could be patriarchal, which is interesting. What's wrong with the word headquarters? Is that is it to do with like having a head or I don't know? Well, it could be that it's maybe it's too. um, uh, it, it's it's is it too logically thinking? You know, what's it? The right hemisphere or the left hemisphere? I can't well, remember. Well, it's just, it's a, it's a strange, you know, one, isn't it? Yeah, uh, because that's supposed um, to be like maths, isn't it? You that's supposed yeah. to be Eurocentric and patriarchal. You know, so, absolutely. Yeah, uh, Daniel, I thought what we could do uh, is we headquarters could... presumes an organisation that is organised under a Western model. Oh yeah, no, I see what you mean. Yeah, see, yeah. so uh, so but but really, it should be a, a I don't know. A, a, a body holistic quarters or a, oh yeah yeah so it's like a sort of post a heart thing. quarters yeah about the whole notion of having like a head organizing things is actually kind of it's patriarchal and colonialist mm, um, yeah. listen daniel um i thought we could play a game uh i you're not looking at this article are you because you could no, choose if you're looking right no, so I, I thought what we should do i have not it. downloaded 90 pages <laughs> No, I mean, neither have I. I'm just looking at the article, which is on the Daily Mail website. But but I thought what we could do is um, I could read out their the words that they're saying you should avoid, and and then after that it says why you should avoid the words. Right. So I'm going to read out the words, and I want you to guess the the reason for not using them, and then we'll see if your answers match the Oxfam language guide yeah does that this, sound this, okay? this sounds like a kind of new diocesan unconscious 
biased <laughs> training course, doesn't it? I, I, I think you're secretly on, on this, aren't you? You're a controlled opposition, Jane. I will be. I will be <laughs> rating you out of five, and then sending this report to your diocese. So yeah. let's do it. Let's do it. So the first, the first words to avoid are little drum roll, mother or father. Now, why, Daniel? Can you explain why these ro- these words are completely unacceptable in today's modern world? Just read Huxley. They're, right. they're, they're offensive, aren't they? Um, because some people yes. might not have a mother or a father at hand, presumably. So it should be a parent. Okay. Or guardian. Okay. So mm, it's a different it's a different rationale given here. But I mean, Ooh. I think that, that's a completely to me, that seems like a very oh sorry, my daughter's driving past on a bike calling at me. Just had to wave to her. Um uh, yeah, sorry, it's put me off a bit. Yeah, no, that's not the rationale they've given here, although I would say that's a very that's a very good rationale because not everyone's got parents. To, uh, well, mm-hmm. But then, yeah, anyway, I was going to say, I mean, the word parent presumably is problematic in that case. Their rationale is in patriarchal culture, social norms around gender, i.e. mother and father, social norms result in designated roles for parents that reflect expectations of that gender. Oh, honestly, it's it's, it's just obvious when it's pointed out to you, isn't it? It's like my gender is a is 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 a social norm which has been assigned to me. And I may or may not identify with it. And by virtue of being assigned to me, it's just assumed that I'm my children's father. I mean, how outrageous can you possibly get? I can see you're 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 waking up to your patriarchy. I'm waking up to reality, Daniel. Mm. I'm waking up to the real world. Some Mm. transgender and non-binary people may identify with these roles. Okay, Yes, I like I like having the option. However, some may prefer to use other names to designate parenthood. So what do you do if those names are mother and father, though? I don't really know, because that's personally I know I want to, you know, mm. I want to open the, the playing field here and to be as liberal as possible. But what if I want to designate myself as a father? Mm. I don't know, but I'm not allowed to, apparently. Mm. Anyway, so I, I don't yeah. know. I'm, I'm afraid Sper- that sperm donor project progenitor and sperm donor and um grow sperm, back sperm donating the incubator <laughs> incubator no the, the the woman's the incubator sure i can't call myself I, no I, no I, i'm I, just saying what different names from a different name from mother yeah yeah, yeah. oh yeah did, did you see that that uh, there were loads on anglican twitter it's becoming quite a depressing space really who are beginning to balk at um, mothering sunday Oh, and how it's oh, offensive, and oh, oh you know, it, 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 now this goes around as much as it comes around. It becomes predictable. You it know. makes me, it makes me feel, it makes me feel uncomfortable to assume people are women. It's just come on, right? Let's do the game. Right, um, hang on, so I could close the door. Oh, the the, the dog, the dog's back. The dog's the dog back. back. Daniel's dog is back in the house. Here we are. And yeah. He's now behind. Yeah, he, he's like wanting to like participate that. in this. He wants to participate. All right, now this. Oh, this is a tricky one. <laughs> No, no. sorry about this daniel avoid sanitary products and feminine hygiene now what do you think could be wrong with that those words why why are they not inclusive words well i, I think there's got to be some kind of trans epiphany in this isn't it maybe maybe uh, is it that there are some men who might use sanitary products in the in the new world order Yo, I'm not sure that's the answer they give. Let's read it out. Let's read it oh, out. Um, no, back to the class, listen, no, listen, listen, listen. The phrase sanitary products implies that periods are in themselves unclean because they're not san- so sanitary products is to a product to make you mm. clean again, isn't it? This reinforces the stigma around menstruation and female reproductive biology, right? This matters because around the world, people have been discriminated about against because of the fact that they men- menstruate. And a large part of the reason is that this makes women unclean. It's kind of strange to me that they're using such feminine language, mm. like women and all this. What's all this about? We know mm. men men menstruate as well, don't they? So what's going on here? Crazy. Um, instead, yeah. instead, I hope people pick up the irony in this segment, by the way. I just want to just imply very strongly that there is a heavy dose of irony here Uh, instead you should use the words menstrual products and period products okay doesn't sound and now they're telling us to avoid the words women and children and lady oh wait 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 i was misunderstanding okay avoid women and children 
the phrase women and children, comma, ladies. Now, can you work out what's wrong with the phrase women and children? Don't avoid the term no, women. Yeah, not the not the two terms, women and children, but the term to get the phrase together, women and children. What's wrong with that? Like if you were addressing a, a, a group and you said women and children, like what would be wrong with saying that? Oh, are, are you now? I think now I, th I think I'm on this. I think I'm on it. Come on. It's to do with that you're uh, distinguishing them from males, men, uh, and therefore you're highlighting uh, a power imbalance. <laughs> it's not the rationale they give. Oh, um, I think on. I think it's totally I think it's totally legit. The other thing I'd say about this is I would have thought the answer would be that women and children kind of just groups women and children together in such a way as that it implies that women are always the primary caregivers of children mm -hmm. while men are off at work. But they've got a much more kind of torturous rationale here. Uh, women and children reaffirms the patriarchal view that women are as helpless as children, neglecting women's actual and potential roles. Well, that's kind of what I was saying that last bit. It wrongly suggests that men are not in need of protection. And does it? Does the phrase, does it? And oh, this is, so, yeah, but this falls on the Titanic thing, isn't it? Where I said women and children on the boats. Yeah. The five boats well, we'll, and, no, and then let them die. Then, then, let them die. Yeah. Um, it implies that women have no agency or capacity to act. Use phrases that do not categorize women and children in the same group. And de depending on the context, be specific about who you are talking about. Where appropriate, acknowledge that men are or can be vict victims as well, particularly in situations of war, Daniel, particularly mm -hmm. in situations of war. Instead, women by itself, men by itself, girls by itself, boys by itself. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be saying that kind of thing. But you also shouldn't be saying biological male or female. You shouldn't be saying male-bodied or female-bodied. You shouldn't be saying natal male or natal, natal female. And you shouldn't say born male or female. So, Daniel, come on, you must know why you shouldn't say those things. Why should you not call someone a biological male? Come on. This is easy. Oh, 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 is it because uh, science is a heteronormative patriarchal construct of, of Western civilization? I'd say that's kind uh, of the, that's kind of the meta. And the, 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 you're trumping biology over gender. Uh, yeah, basically that's right. So no one, nobody, whether cisgender or transgender, gets to choose what sex they're assigned at birth. That's because babies can't choose things. Obviously, this term is preferred to which term? Oh, cisgender or transgender? Oh, what? I don't know. This term, I don't know what they're referring to, is preferred to biological male slash female, male slash female bodied natal male slash female and born male slash female, which are inaccurate and do not respect. They do not respect the identity of transgender people. So don't mm -hmm. you tell me that you've just given birth to a boy just because it has a penis, just because it has male reproductive organs. That's disrespectful to the trans community. Thank you very much. Right. But this this is beginning to sound like a Girl Guides talk <laughs> isn't it? In, in the new directives as well. Maybe it could double up. It could do. Right. This uh, one. Is, you know, this one what is, did I learn today? You know, in, in the old system, you'd go away and maybe maybe you'd, um, I don't know. Uh, I should have said that. Why you've done a Girl Guides or Brownies. You know, you, you maybe yeah. sort of, uh, made a um, uh, made a fire, you know, and yeah. learned how to do that. Or you'd uh, made some beautiful bit of craft, you know, mm. and now now you've got to be re-educated. You have to be. I mean, I should have said that to the midwife, shouldn't I, after she delivered, helped to deliver my our latest child, who was a boy. It's actually surprising. You know, I've been involved in four births over the last six years, seven years, and all the midwives have been thoroughly inculcated in this kind of patriarchal no. um, structuralist language, which is frankly offensive, mm -hmm. right? Now, come the is, revolution, it'll all... It will all end, so hopefully. It'll all hopefully they're just, they're, and midwives, I mean, goodness gracious me, even the name just speaks, mm -hmm. it reeks of patriarchy. Uh, right, this is the last one, okay, because we've got to move on to, to other things. Avoid... Now, this is interesting. Avoid. <clears throat> LGBT, mm. LGBTQIX, homosexuality, gay and lesbian, in brackets, if used alone, 
to refer to the whole LGBTQIA plus community. Now, what is wrong? There's a bit of a hint there in that in that parenthesis. What's wrong with those? What's wrong with LGBT, Daniel? What's wrong with that? Why can't you say that? Is that because it misses the QTAXI plus? Yeah, basically, I'll, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. There are various. This is the this is their word. There are various versions of this acronym that include different letters to represent different groups. It's important to note that some people consider the plus to indicate others not explicitly covered in this acronym to be insufficient. So LGBTQIA plus, that is the best um, phrase mm. for the whole spectrum of gay, bisexual, lesbian, transgender, queer, intersex, mm. asexual, plus other people. Because using LGB is now considered to be quite offensive, isn't oh, it? Oh, LGB is, is because it, it's oh. seen as transphobic. It's yeah. completely, it's completely unacceptable. It's completely unacceptable. Other words, unacceptable. Mankind, for obvious reasons, attitudes and behaviours, because it mm. uh, refers to collective. Oh, what does it? Oh, I can't even work out these these rationales. Uh, B A M E. You're not allowed to say that. You have to say BIPOC or people of colour, black market, obviously, it's totally racist, mm -hmm. ethnic minority, it should instead be a minority ethnic person, thank you very much, migration crisis, it, yeah. saying the word migration crisis, apparently the, their alternative is migration as a complex phenomenon, that doesn't, but that the problem with that is it doesn't fulfil the same grammatical need in a sentence, does it, so you might, you might have to think about that, Lo um, local language, local people, uh, that's unacceptable because it's confusing. Local staff, for example, is confusing. Local to where? Anyone can be local, depending on the context. Because it's we don't confusing. belong to... We yeah. must remember, we belong nowhere. We are just a global... Yeah. Group. I mean, think think about it. Think about it. If you say the word local to someone, they'll be thinking, local to where? Mm. They'll be thinking... I mean, I can't it's, like it's like in the Southwest. It's like in the Southwest. Some people, when they get a scone, they put the cream on top and... <laughs> And the that's okay for local thing. people. That's okay for then, local people. And then local some people do it, and some people that it's we don't talk about do yeah. it the other way around. But, but if you if you were to say Daniel locals, yeah. if you were to say locals do it, people people would be rightly thinking local to where? I've got no idea what this word can possibly well, mean. Hallelujah, um, and thank you to Oxfam. Thank you. But, oh, you I know, found that I found the headquarters one, the mm. rationale of headquarters. Uh, the reason why you shouldn't use the word high headquarters. It's exactly as you say, implies a power dynamic that prioritizes one office over another. In the context in which we work, the implication is very colonial, reinforcing mm. hierarchical power issues and a top-down approach. You were you were absolutely right. Instead, name the specific office mm. or location. Don't say headquarters. Say can you say the base? Could you say the base? Mm. Radio Ministry of Truth. I find Ministry of Truth is quite it's, you know. It's quite yeah. egalitarian, isn't it, really? You know, it is, it is. Loads of loads of stuff. You can't use the word death, apparently. You can't use death. Word death, death. Death. Oh, I think you said death. That's, that's <laughs> wrong. That's people, people with people probably with our hearing. listeners are coming near to you. <laughs> people with hearing impairments, please. You can't say poor people. No. So you say people experiencing um poverty and you can't use the word beneficiaries or recipients because the people they work with are not passive beneficiaries they receive mm. support so they say instead people we work with so you can't say recipients and there's lots more so anyway i'll post a link up to the the article there so that's really well, in interesting they'll need stuff. to we'll need to redo the beatitudes aren't we blessed, blessed are, are the are, um what people was it? we support no poor was instead of poor you people who are affected by poverty Blessed are the people affected by poverty, poverty of spirit spiritually. Yeah. yeah, you were. Yeah, but is is the whole idea of a spirit? Is that sort of patriarchal for some reason? I, I don't know why. Yeah, well, it's something from above, isn't it? Coming down. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Sort of it's, invading it, it, you, like a very, trans, anything it, transcendent. You know. It's yeah, kind it's kind of. I think the whole thing is extremely uh, uh, patriarchal. Yeah. Um, Daddy, we should talk about something a uh, bit more. Yeah, well, that's important. great. I mean, to talk about the, near you, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's talk about the um, this uh, um, interesting article in the Spectator uh, by Andrew Tettenborn, which is about mm -hmm. Justin Welby's. Well, it's called Justin Welby's gay marriage troubles could be about to get worse, uh, and it's basically about um, this group of MPs, which is led by uh, Ben Bradshaw, who 
it says here he's a long-standing churchman but he's yeah he, he's very prominent in Exeter cathedral oh is that right but he's sort yeah. of he's quite a sort of lgbt sort of activist oh sorry yeah. lgb oh i've done it already daniel hang on it's quite a let me see back of the class it's LGBT. lgbtqia plus activist isn't yeah. it so so i mean do you do you want to you flag this up do you want to sort of give us a little bit of a summary of what's going on here um well he's had an axe to grind about the church of england's uh synod uh feeling that it hasn't gone far enough um uh therefore has argued that we should um the parliament should basically take over the matter and give clergy the right to do legal marriages legal same-sex marriage in church mm. um irrespective of the church of england's doctrine mm. uh so that in in essence we would align with scotland not quite with wales would we and but but also with america with the episcopal church there and a few other provinces um and then in a parliamentary speech about a week or so ago with the first estates minister who is like the church of england's representative he's like the minister for the church of england for the, in parliament uh who, who basically seemed to agree with him on this that you know we shouldn't be too concerned about the, the broader wider anglican communion um yeah uh, or um, he, he used this rather offensive word you know sort of homophobes the home of churches and communities and provinces that were essentially homophobic we should just jettison them have a sort of cleansing really a theological cleansing and give local clergy as parliament the power to do what they would like to you know what they want to do what they so choose uh without any directive from the sea of the, the sea of canterbury or york so um uh and i think yesterday there was a 10 minute bill but i don't think it got through as far as i know there was a 10 minute reading um I, yes i couldn't find much reference to it to be honest but um uh yeah i i think uh our spectator article is, is picking up on you know various moves really to circumnavigate the church's authority yeah yeah well this this i i detect the cold the cold clammy hand of uh sandy toxvig do you remember that video she made where she said i'm going to get my allies together and see what can be done maybe this is mm -hmm. uh maybe this is her maybe she's maybe she's trying to to go for it but this is um this is an interesting this is an interesting one um it reminds me of the um it reminds me in the 19th century, as as everything does, uh, of the the sermon that was preached by John Keeble, which was called National Apostasy, which is seen historically as the thing which kicked off the o Oxford movement, which became in time the the Anglo Catholic movement, um, and um, and and there, you know, John Keeble was making the point that uh, we shouldn't have all these non Anglicans in Parliament telling the Church what to do in in various different ways, and that was a that was one of the sort of drivers behind the Church's. Um, rediscovery of the importance of the the role of of the of the episcopate of, of bishops you know to provide mm. actual spiritual leaders leadership rather than this um mm. what, what would technically be called erastian leadership which means being led by a secular state mm. essentially and i mean as with all of these things i you know i'm sure the people who are involved in these discussion don't even understand they don't understand mm. any of these they, they don't understand the history they don't understand theology they don't understand anything to do with the church or anything like that but that's the basic issue here is that who should be making decisions in the church is it is it the state is it the secular state or is it the church's spiritual rulers and spiritual leaders and clearly we no, should it's, it's intensely parochial vision yeah. of the church isn't it it's one yeah. that the church is essentially uh a national body like any other that yes. that yeah you know, uh let, let's say like libraries you know and um uh, and and therefore shouldn't discriminate in any way or should follow exactly the same policies of um all, all other secular authorities and institutions yeah uh and um, it ignores the church catholic let alone 2000 years of history the mind of christ you know the bible the doctrine 
um, what the mainstream of most other churches do. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. You know, and it's kind of like you know, oh well, you know, if if these if if these um, uh, post-colonial provinces in Africa and elsewhere um, don't want this, well, they're just a bit backwards. So we'll mm. we'll jettison our relationship with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. I mean, this I mean, this is the this the quote you were referring to, is it? Why? So this is Tony, Second Church Commissioner Tony mm. Baldry. Why is the unity of the Church of England with, say, the Church of Uganda or the Church in South Sudan more important than the unity of the Church of England with its sister churches in Scotland and Wales? And I think that that's the um, that reflects a well a poverty of understanding of what mm. we understand the church to be we are as 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 anglicans we confess that we are part of one a holy catholic and apostolic church which is not only about the church as it exists today it's also about the church of the past which the church mm. you know, the members of which are now in heaven and the church of the the future as well and we are united not through political agreement but we're united in the doctrine of the faith which is mm. delivered to us through christ and the apostles so if you've got churches in scotland and wales that are departing from the faith then that's how we that's how we recognize it we recognize it as a departure and we mm. recognize churches say in uganda or south sudan as, as those who are holding fast to the to the faith and so um and they're, they're part of the anglican communion anyway and we we see them as as our brothers and sisters and we don't want to cause unnecessary fissures in the body of christ through false teaching and, and false doctrine so this this kind of idea that we should just we should sort of um adjust our doctrine of marriage so that it it fits mm -hmm. with the churches in scotland and wales it's absolutely preposterous yeah am i am i right in saying that this is the article because i've got a feeling christian concern may have done a commentary on it so right this give is me if i'm if, if i'm Often I'm reading. I'm reading the one. I'm reading like, one. By Spectator by Andrew. Um, but the, the the implication was that that if this happened and Parliament did impose a marriage law on the church, that um, refusal to um, take on these rights by any minister could, like like in the civil sphere, be um, an act of discrimination. You yeah, know, you know what happens. So, yeah civil ministers yeah, civil yeah. registrars um will most likely lose their job if that because there's no conscience clause yeah yeah well yeah of course of, i mean i didn't see that but i mean that makes perfect sense doesn't it i mean if this if this happened it would it would destroy the church of england because so many people would leave i would have thought ministers um mm -hmm. People, you know, people in congreg congreg whole congregations would leave if Parliament established a principle whereby if the church didn't change its doctrine or its practice in some way that Parliament wanted it to, they would simply push a bill through and force it to. I mean, you know, I think a lot of people would have a serious, mm. serious problem with that. I would have a, I would have a serious problem with that mm. if we basically saw the Church of England becoming the the puppet of the progressive liberal post-christian state you know that well, like some of the nordic example. churches yeah is that the way it works in yeah i, I think I, I think in essence you know there's a dwindling small um presence uh nothing in comparison to their historic past yeah and they're they're essentially um, an arm of the state really yes uh, and um much more so than we. I mean, you know, my my, my worry is I could see it, I could see a point where in 20, 30 years time across Western Europe we have a kind of reshifting of uh of ecumenical tectonic plates where you know you can think of a, a liberal version of Roman Catholicism, a sort of Germ Germanic Catholicism breaks off in schism, unites itself with you know lutherans and anglicans liberal anglicans mm. and that conservative anglicans likewise mm. break off and unite with a whole bunch of other bodies you know um mm. most of the anglican communion and uh, and other uh, and other denominations mm. uh, uh and you get the you get these two versions of christianity even more polarized i mean maybe that might be a good thing i don't know maybe that would maybe that clear maybe water 
that may be the future. And and since you're since you raised that, Daniel, it might be worth doing a little update with a couple of things in the Roman Roman Catholic world. I mean, the first thing we had was those um, the German bishops essentially saying that they were going to start doing gay mm-hmm. marriage, um, come what may. You know, so the question there is, Roger wrote a good piece about this in his sub Substack. But the question there is, well, is the Pope and the Vatican going to do anything about that? Because if they don't do anything about that, that establishes a precedent whereby mm-hmm. churches in different countries can just defy the Vatican and do what they like, and and the Vatican won't do anything. Um, but if they do do something, it would obviously create an awful lot of controversy in many other ways, not least the legal uh, complications, mm-hmm. let's say, that it would entail because the German church is um, ent- entangled with the state in various different ways in 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 Germany. So there's there was that going on, and and as as far as I know, nothing's really happened there. The other thing I the uh, well in in terms of a response, the other thing I thought was really interesting that I heard this week is um, I heard on Holy Smoke about the opening, and we have talked about this thing before, mm-hmm. but it's it's now open. I think the opening of the Abrahamic, uh, oh yeah, family house, yeah. which is in um, is it in Abu Dhabi? Is that where it Abu is? Abu Dhabi, yeah. Yeah, it's in Abu Dhabi. So this is basically kind of three enormous churches, uh, a Muslim, well, you know, a Christian church, a synagogue and a and a Muslim mosque. And these are all kind of part of the same complex. I'm kind of I don't really understand. It says it's a place for all um, people from all walks of life to exchange knowledge and practice and and faith. Um, and the the thing I was listening to, the Holy Smoke podcast was saying that Pope Francis actually signed a document which says, or at least implies, that the existence of other religions is the will of God. And, um, you know, that these, I mean, I I guess, you know, the implication is that these religions are all sort of legitimate expressions of our common human, our common humanity. I mean, that's what it says, diverse in our faith, common in our humanity, together in in peace. And, you know, I really do recommend, um, if people are interested, to go and read... uh, uh, Vladimir Soloviev's uh, a short tale about the Antichrist. Uh, he was a kind of mis- mystical visionary who I think foresaw a lot of this stuff, which is a kind of universalism, uh, a universal universalism of religion. And the attractive thing about this universalism of religion is that it promises peace. So all we need to do is lay aside our doctrinal and religious distinctiveness and then we can be one common humanity and together we can have peace and that comes across the short tale about the antichrist is a kind of imagine Im- imagining of what the very end will be like when the when the antichrist comes and it's incredibly powerful it's not very long um but it's precisely this is is the antichrist essentially his message is all you need to do is lay these things lay these things aside and come together and and come together under me under the Antichrist, and I will bring you peace. I will give you. I I will give you what what you desire, and um, it it's like it's like the devil in the wilderness tempting Christ. It's like, well, you know, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world mm. if you will just bow down and worship me. And that's, yeah, that's and, and each each each, uh, each request from Satan in in that is is totally reasonable, isn't it? Yes, they're, they're all. Uh, they're, they're sort of greased with a certain rationale <laughs> that you can see that, you know, turning bread into, turning stone into bread uh, is, a, is a quite reasonable thing. Yes. Ending ending hunger uh, for yourself or for others, you know, well, what, well, why not? Um, uh, and likewise, you know, toning down Christianity, say, mm. uh, or uh, toning it down, toning down the divinity of Christ, the Holy Trinity, the salvific work of Christ. You know, we can say, so, well, you know, we just we won't emphasize those things so much because they they cause rancor and um, uh, and, and we'd rather just focus on the nice things yeah. that bind us together. I mean, I, I noticed looking at the website of the. Um, uh, of this new institution that um it's it's interesting that the courses that they're offering are very much in that ilk uh there, there was nothing you know there, there wasn't a course on that that sort of looked at from what i could see the very divisive natures of each religion 
Mm. Uh, you know, so you could end up with uh, liberal imams talking to liberal clergy and, and liberal rabbis mm -hmm. uh, about nothing much in particular. Yes. Yes. Uh, and so in, in, in one way, it doesn't actually necessarily do the the cause uh, of living peacefully with our neighbours that much good because it sweeps up, in my view, it sweeps under the carpet, the theological issues. Yeah, yeah. And, and well, it reminds me of that verse in Jeremiah, you know, they've, they've healed the wound of my people lightly, saying peace, peace, when there, when there is no peace. Um, there is there is a fundamental conflict between the so-called Abrahamic religions. I don't mean a violent conflict. I just mean a contradiction, which is Christ. Christ is the contradiction. You know, the Mus Islams deny that Christ is the son of God, that he is the second person of the Trinity. And the Jewish faith denies that Christ is the Messiah. And that's what we affirm as Christians. And that's what you have to lay aside in order to, as they say, come together in peace, diverse in our faith, yet common in our humanities. Our values are, they write, peaceful coexistence, curiosity, and the centrality of human fraternity. That, they, I mean, yeah, I don't really read that very much in scripture. They embody, no. continues, the multiculturalism and diversity of the UAE, United Arab Emirates, where communities from more than 200 nationalities live together peacefully. Am I, I think... right in saying that in Abu Dhabi, um christian proselytization uh, remains a capital offense uh, uh, I, I was, and that you can only hold christian services that are in a registered denomination you see so, so i would say in that respect how can we have three tents side by side if that is the prerequisite to any discussion yeah I, I I I think you're you you may very well be right about that. And I was about to say, is it not the case that you if you apostatize from Islam, that carries the death penalty? And yes, yeah, sorry, excuse yeah. yeah, excuse me. It's, it's apostasy, but I think proselytization is also I illegal. I, I, it's not. I, I, yeah. I imagine it. I imagine it may very well be if that's what happens if you if you if you apostatize from Islam. So I mean, you could you know I mean, um, Damien Thompson put the kind of well, you know, this is an economic. Thing mm. on their part you know they're trying to you know they're we're, we're 200 nationalities living together peacefully you should visit and and give us your money and become a tourist um so there may be there may be a part that part of that mm. as a kind of exercise in in soft power as well mm. but but really i mean you know from a spiritual perspective you have to wonder what's going on the other the, the other sort of i mean maybe this is a humorous thing maybe not but the the christian church which is it's not technically roman catholic although it's i think it's run by roman catholics the way it seems anyways certainly pope francis sort of is very involved in this but it's called the, i think it's called the church of his holiness francis mm -hmm. and it's apparently named after francis of assisi but it really sounds like it's named after the pope because it's well a, I, I thought listening to damien thompson's podcast there was some confusion over that yeah no it, they, I mean, they it, couldn't it, quite figure out whether it was the pope or it, whether it was st francis of assisi or both yeah but I mean, I think in any case, you know, it's quite clear that the the Pope Francis is a universalist in the sense that you couldn't, you just could not support a project like this unless you believed that the, these other religions are as legitimate as Christianity, and and the, and the whole thing is shot through with that. You know, it, it uses this language. I'm not on the right page now, but it uses the language of, um, you know, one of the Abrahamic one of the Abrahamic religions. So Christianity is one of the Abrahamic religions. So is Judaism. So is Islam. We're all we're all from the same father, Abraham. Um, that's where we sort of have our that's where we have our unity. But as I which, said, which in itself is a questionable claim. Uh, yeah, well, for sure. I mean, you, you, why why choose why just choose a, a character? I mean, a person, a real person, very important person, but just one person who, you know, who who is in the who's in the scriptures and and say that we have unity mm. in him i you know i don't i don't really see that and and you know that the other thing is i wonder how i wonder how orthodox jews and muslims feel about this kind of thing as well because is that legit for them as well just to say oh well you know we all respect abraham so we're all you know we're all abrahamic religions you know i don't know what do you think mm. well you know <sighs> It's difficult to say, isn't it? But uh, 
l- looking at the looking at the Christian Church and the pictures within as as one of the th- three structures in it. I thought the whole the actual interior looked very anodyne and plain. Yeah. Um, in fact, the other two did as well in in many ways, and you know, sort of the sort of contemporary architecture that seemed about 50, 60 years out of date, really mm. monolithic. Um, and 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 lacking the the kind of full depth of Christian architecture you could have had, you know, mm. yeah, uh, that it it all, they all look very samey as spaces, and that to me communicates uh, an attempt at a uh, at a shallow unity. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? The uh, the His Holiness Francis, not not the Pope Church, it uses these timber battens. I can only see a small photo here, but they 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 look like pillars um it almost looks like a kind of um a sort of uh roman i mean i don't mean roman as in like roman catholic i mean like roman is in like the you know uh, ancient rome it looks like a kind of um these look like kind of doric col- columns um or maybe i don't know maybe it's more grecian I'm, i don't really know but it doesn't really look christian at all it looks like a something from something from the age of uh, greco-roman an- antiquity to me to, as you say it's got it's got a flat roof as well which you you never really associate with any sort of form of of uh, yeah it, it looked <laughs> so i mean this is me and my geekiness it, it, i thought it looked more like the jedi temple yeah it does imagine like yoda jedi to temple. come out yeah, uh, of yeah. it you know yeah but, but that's Anakin the, has like... killed all the jedi <laughs> hey but daniel i mean it's an interesting it's an interesting point because buildings do reflect the 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 metaphysics that, that are put into them. So that's where the Gothic cathedral, um, you know, that's why there are so many points and uh, and uh, pointed arches and pointed windows is because they're pointing upwards. It's a transcendent thing, and your 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 eyes and and as a result, your your soul or your heart is being lifted upwards all the time because it's saying, you know, it's God, it's God, it's God. You know, it's up there. It's transcendent. You know, it's above you. It towers above you. Mm-hmm. Whereas this, it's columns going up, yes, but a flat roof. So what it's saying is imminence, enclosure. It's all about this space here. It's not pointing up there. And I do think that's really significant. Mm. Mm. So there we go. Anyway, a couple of other things, Daniel, a complete, mm. complete right turn here. So um, one thing I just wanted to touch on, and I don't understand this because I don't understand um, Dutch politics, but I did see that we've had this this Dutch farmers protest party who have celebrated a shock win in the Dutch elections. Now the backstory here for people who don't know it is essentially that the <laughs> Dutch, the Dutch government headed by uh, mm. WF stooge, Mark Rutter were attempting to literally steal uh, Dutch farmers land because they'd made up this arbitrary nitrogen quota, uh, which they were saying had to be fulfilled in order for the environment to be protected um because it's okay to to steal things um if you're if you're protecting the environment apparently including farmland and people's livelihoods and, and way of life but the, the this dutch farmers these dutch farmers have started up some kind of protest party and they've they've absolutely they've absolutely smashed this election and it, as far as i can tell it's 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 left mark rutter's four party coalition in a, in an absolute shambles it's a shock mm. election win so it seems like really good news. Is that the way you sort of... Yeah, and, and, but what's odd about it is in the mainstream media in this country, it, it's complete non-story. It's not reported. Um, I, I can't recall seeing this on the BBC website more than yeah. just in passing. Uh, and I find that quite extraordinary. Again, you know, is it because farming community and that culture along with you know blue collar workers and that are seen by the metropolitan elites as the deplorables mm. um, you know uh, in the same way that you know sort of in this country daily mail readers brexiteers and so on are you know or there's a there's a lump of people that are uh, are vilified by the 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 intelligentsia and the the mainstream media uh and um uh, yeah, so so I think it it also points out, doesn't it, that um, the whole rush to a net zero by twenty fifty, which I think scientists in the UN are now saying should be brought forward by ten years, it just shows that that, <laughs> that is not 
<laughs> that that is not a political given and that let's actually underneath the surface yeah there's quite a lot of rumblings about this i think it, someone said a few years ago and it one that um if this was put on a referendum in the uk um it it might not get the success <laughs> that, mm. that 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 its um, proposals its proponents might want um mm. Uh, yeah, and, and and I think farming communities, as, as we know it here in the southwest, are are actually a very marginalised group of people, both you know politically and culturally. Uh, and I I could see um, you know similar sort of things that happen in the um, in the early noughties with the Countryside Alliance and that, mm. which had some of the largest protests yeah. next to the Iraq War that that ever that ever happened. You know because. Yeah. Um, you know, something like farming is is um, is a, is a is a wonderful vocation, but it's also a thankless task. You know, yeah. and um, they they get it in the neck from the supermarkets. They get it in the neck from politicians. They get it in the neck now from the extinction rebellion. You know, environmental nuts. Um, and it's no wonder that it has one of the highest suicide rates. Mm. Yeah, well, and, um, and um, I have to say as well, I mean, this might sound like quite a sort of shallow comment in this context, but my eyes were really opened by watching the two series of Clarkson's Farm, I have to say. I mean, I didn't really even give it much thought. I thought, oh, I don't want to, sort of, I don't want to sort of program about Jeremy Clarkson on a farm. That sounds ridiculous. But then when I actually watched it, particularly the second series, you see like how difficult things are for these people and when they're even trying to innovate you know when when all their subsidies are taken away because of because mm -hmm. of brexit and they and and suddenly they're facing this enormous financial black hole when they try and innovate mm -hmm. and and do anything then these these jumped up egotists on a power trip at local councils won't let them do anything and they're they're just trying to well it's like they're trying to ruin them and these are the people who produce our food. You know, this is why I think this is so outrageous. I mean, apart from the sort of immorality, the basic immorality of just trying to force buy people's land. It's something like out of Soviet Russia or something. But, you know, Mark Rutter, I mean, what is he? You know, who does he think he is? You know, these pe we literally need these people to m make our food so that we can live. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, oh, they produce too much nitrogen, so we're going to take their farms away. It's outrageous that this is happening and the fact that it's happening in the Western world and our media media barely report on it. The BBC mm. barely report on it, probably or they don't report on it, probably because they they're absolutely they're absolutely terrified that similar things could happen here mm. or that there could be a, a a a referendum on Dutch membership in the EU, for example, which I which I understand is is something there would be a lot of su support for in in, in Holland. So it's just what these people are, you know, these sort of elitists living in this in this bubble where they have these ideas mm -hmm. and they've got no idea about the real world implications of it. I mean, yeah, I mean, a, a true conservationism, which I, I think, you know, exists in most farming communities and families, you know, is sits on the shoulders of centuries of wisdom. Yeah. Uh, and to do a sort of Leninist five year plan. um. And, and basically push all all these um all, all these historic farms in our countries out of business um is is a, is a monumental folly yes. uh, and i think we're probably seeing already some of the signs of that you know that with the demands of fruit and veg are, are not as forthright as they uh, as they were a, a year or so ago you know we begin to see the effects of um a um uh, a, a sort of environmental fanaticism beginning to have its impact really on mm. farming communities and and what these people can you know humanely de yeah, de deliver I, yeah. Well, with the sort of pressures of that that are put on them yeah. by by not only the um uh, the food industry but but also now the sort of new political zeitgeist yeah absolutely i completely agree and we should have more of this we should have more truckers protests and more farmers protests and more working people standing up to these scumbag globalists who think they can just do whatever the hell they want just because they've been just because they've won an election it's absolutely outrageous mm -hmm. daniel uh, before i can 
blow my top here. We've got to move on because I know you've got to do your taxi for dad. So a couple of things. Um, so just wanted to just say a quick word about this Christian lecturer who was sacked for his a tweet where he said that homosexuality was invading the church. His name is um, Dr. Aaron Edwin, Edwards, and he um, he was dismissed for allegedly bringing a Methodist college called Cliff College into disrepute because of this because of this tweet. Uh, where he said the first line was homosexuality is invading the church. And um, then he went on to say evangelicals no longer see the severity of this because they're busy apologising for their apparently barbaric homophobia, whether or not it's true. This is a gospel issue, he says, by the way. If sin is no longer sin, we no longer need a saviour. And and, and he was eventually um, uh, suspended and, and then sacked. But it's interesting. I mean, the thing I just wanted to pick up on here, and we are limited for time, but it's interesting to me that this is in the context of Methodism, and this bit in the, the Daily Telegraph says, the Methodist church globally has traditionally understood that marriage is the lifelong union of one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others and the only appropriate context for sexual intimacy, right? But there was a vote in which the governing body of the Methodist church allowed same-sex marriage in places of worship, even though it didn't change its doctrine. Sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, because you could say a very similar thing, not to be too coy about it, but a similar thing is happening in the Church of England. So, so are you saying then that was it Niebuhr's haunting phrase about orthodoxy, when a new orthodoxy emerges and we're told it's optional, that it soon becomes the all-controlling force? Exactly. And here it carries on. Since the vote, some Methodist church leaders and members say they have found themselves in the position of being compelled to affirm same-sex marriage while also continuing to teach the biblical belief that homosexual practice is sinful. So on the one hand, they're saying they're saying mar uh, sexual intimacy is only appropriate for a marriage between a man and woman. But on the other hand, they're being forced to affirm same-sex marriage. So it's it's. It's, but it's, it's, but the point I'm making is that it's very similar to the situation in the Church of England, isn't it? We're saying, well, we're going to allow this liturgy through, but we're not changing our doctrine. But the liturgy contradicts our doctrine. That's the point. Mm. Mm. Um, Daniel, you've got yeah. to go in a minute, don't you? I'll have to go in a minute, yeah. Uh, you, 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 um, you can, I mean, you do, you, do you have any f further comment on this? I'll, I'll do the email of the week after you've gone. No, I think I've said what I need, need to say, really. And I think, um, you know, the danger is inclusivity very quickly moves to sacking. Yes, Inclu inclusivity seems to have a sort of inbuilt exclusivity, doesn't it? Which mm. is which is a funny one. Yeah. Um, great. Well, Daniel, good luck with your taxi for dad. Um, I'll do. I'll do the. Yeah, it's good to we'll catch up. Um, yeah, great to catch up, and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks for being with me. Take care. God bless. Okay. Bye now. Okay. Well, um, it's just me now. Just me, Reverend Jay, and that's okay because that means I can just speak without having to allow anyone else to speak no that's just a joke it's always good to listen it's always good to listen to people and you know what since daniel's gone and there's no pressure on my time i'm going to do a little bit at the end where i'm going to share some thoughts for my week just just to in, just to indulge just to indulge you so so stay stay tuned for that if you're interested but i wanted to do an email of the week now we've been reading out some emails about the russia ukraine situation <clears throat> from different perspectives and part of the reason that we've been doing this is because I really don't know what to make of this situation. I've always been thinking to myself, well, I don't like being told uniformly by the media what to believe. And I'm suspicious when I hear the entire corporate media trying to brainwash everyone into believing some kind of propagandist message. Right. So I'm suspicious when that happens, when there's no comment really giving another perspective. However, you know, just because that's happening, it doesn't mean that there aren't elements of truth in it. So, you know, it could be the case that, for example, Russia is is deeply wrong in invading uh, Ukraine and that Putin is is, uh, you know, is a, is a deeply immoral man. And, and all the things that the 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 media say, I mean, I just yeah, I just I just don't know. And I'm just interested to hear people's perspectives. And I'm sorry if that makes me either, you know, heartless and not affirming the pro Ukraine Ukrainian message or, you know, a, a a cuck, because I don't believe that this is, you know, what we were being told is is totally the opposite of the truth. I'm just open minded. And I think it's a good thing to be open minded. So today I'm going to read 
an article which is or an email which is more critical of Ukraine, having read one which was more critical of Russia a couple of weeks ago. And I'm sorry if you don't like it, as many people clearly don't, but I think it's a reasonable way to approach this. Um, so there you go. Uh, that's my rationale. So anyway, this is from a, a, a friend of mine or somebody I met actually in a church in London um, who is um, is uh, somebody, actually, I forget where he's from. Hang on a second. He, he He's from he's from a country from an orthodox country capital o orthodox country but i'm sorry i can't actually remember where um and i'm going to read it out now so uh, it starts with a greeting and then says you were so right to identify the west's real reason for being so supportive of ukraine so much of what is done in ukraine by the zelensky regime is an assault on the religious character of the country you were right when you identified that the west sees ukraine as some sort of secular vanguard in their battle against what they see as the old world one of faith and tradition i did surmise that that may have been the case a few weeks ago. I wasn't sure. I was just suggesting it. Anyway, he continues. As noted in your email, if you read out Russia, I think he means that you read out, Russia is not some ideal society as if one has ever existed. But please look into what is happening at the Petchurch Lavra, Petchurch Lavra, which presumably means the Lavra Church. This Kiev cave monastery is one of the holiest sites in the Eastern Orthodox world, especially in Eastern Europe. It is the residence of Bishop Onufrius, the Metropolitan of all Kiev and head of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. This is the canonical Orthodox Church, and they have been in possession of the monastery for almost a thousand years. The monks there live a simple, godly and ascetic life of prayer and have never done any harm to anyone. They are now being expelled. The monks are going to be forced out of their monastery under threat of violence from some very extreme right-wing Ukrainian nationalists. The West is in full support of this policy of their great hero Zelensky. The media report this has justified based on the fact that the UOC, that is the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church, is, quote, Russian-backed or, quote, tied to Moscow. This is not only theologically illiterate, but also untrue. The UOC has been forced to distance itself from the Moscow Patriarchate and has, to all intents and purposes, severed ties. They are still canonically joined as the Kiev, as the Kiev Patriarch is appointed by Moscow. But Onufrias and the UOC have come out against the invasion repeatedly. This has not helped them at all. They face severe persecution and oppression. This after enduring years of almost total annihilation under the communists. Now the West backs this attack as it supports their secularist agenda. Just look at how the cultural ministry in Kiev talks of the relics of Orthodox saints as present potential exhibits in a museum they propose for the monastery. This is the face of the West and its drive to desecration and destruction of religion. Zelensky is a zealot who will brook no opposition of any kind. Why has he gone on after the Ukrainian Orthodox Church? Why the silence over their persecution? And then he goes on to say, the head of the UOC is going to lose his residence and there has not been so much as a peep out of the Western media or churches. Metropolitan Anufrius is a true Christian, keeping his vows and holding true to the Orthodox faith. We Orthodox have survived Muslim Arabs, the Turks, the communists and the Nazis. But the threat posed by the West and its new faith is an enemy with a totalitarian face we haven't seen before. God bless you and all your work. So that's pretty shocking, really, when you when you when you hear it. I mean, is is this true? And if this is true, then how come we never hear anything about it? How come all the leaders of the Anglican Church and the Roman Catholic Church and every other church you ever see in the media just unambiguously support Ukraine in what they're doing and President Zelensky? And they're desperate to be seen to be supporting him. It does seem to be very, very strange. And this is not some kind of uh, mad um, conspiracy theory or some kind of pipe dream. This is really happening. Now, you might have you might not like this guy, but I'm about to play a clip by um, from uh, Fox News's Tucker Carlson. And I, I'm not going to do the uh, the the visuals because um, because, uh, well, well, maybe I should. But sometimes when I do the visuals, I get um, I get the situation where they take my money away on YouTube, which I don't really want to do. But I guess I'll I guess I'll do that because they have you know they can scan for the the images and then they they don't let you monetize it. But let's let's do it. Let's watch a bit of this. Let's watch a bit of this clip here. So here we go. This is uh this is Tucker Carlson 
um, talking about this. Here we go. He's now closing churches belonging to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. He says the country needs spiritual independence. So you have to ask yourself, he's literally shutting churches and arresting priests and nuns. That's um, Zelensky, by the way. And for people who aren't watching this, it says Zelensky is closing Ukrainian Orthodox churches. And it's got this, this image of lots of lots of people um, wearing raincoats uh, standing around. I don't really know who they are. Now, the video is frozen. Hang on a second. I just got to refresh. Sometimes it does that when I'm doing this Twitter stuff. Gremlins in the machine. Here we go. Belonging to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. He says the country needs spiritual independence. So you have to ask yourself, he's literally shutting churches and arresting priests and nuns. This is happening on the Internet. You can see it if you want. So why aren't Christian leaders in the United States saying anything about this and instead endorsing it effectively, as Russell Moore and many others have? Megan Basham is a reporter with The Daily Wire. She joins us tonight. Megan, thanks so much for coming on. This seems like a big deal. I can't remember in my lifetime a European country closing churches and throwing Christians in jail at this scale. Why do no Christian leaders here notice it? Yeah, it's pretty surprising because when you look at the situation here, they are ejecting monks from an 11th century monastery. Um, there are saints buried beneath this church. And you don't see this type of behavior in liberal democracies. And no. so you think those who held Zelensky out as a particular hero who cheered him, who assured us this is someone that we need to support, that we need to throw our support behind as Christians would now be questioning his particular actions. And we're not seeing that. Um, there's really been total silence as he has begun doing what can in many ways be called persecution of members of the Ukrainian Orthodox faith. So why is that silence there? Um, I would even point to the fact that we're not even seeing a lot of coverage of it from outlets like Christianity Today, which Russell Moore is the editor in chief of. And that's just some big questions that I have. How can you write so many essays about Trump, who hasn't been in office for three years now, but really say nothing about what is religious persecution? Possibly, or Ukraine says they have found leaflets, but that's all that they're pointing to is um, they found some rubles and leaflets in these churches, not weapons, um, nothing you know particularly scary. So you have to wonder why the silence. Well, it's absolutely shameful. They're closing churches and arresting priests and Christian leaders here say nothing about it. I think that's I think it's genuinely shameful. And I appreciate your reporting on this. So there we go. I mean, I I I share uh, Tucker Carlson's concern about all of this. I mean, it just makes you. Uh, you know, it makes you it makes you wonder what is going on when when Christian leaders who Christian leaders in in the Church of England, Christian leaders in the Roman Church, when they are going out to Ukraine and unambiguously supporting the regime there. I mean, do they know? Do they know about this? Do they know about what's going on? If they do, they need to say something. They need to denounce it. You know, it's it's evil. It's persecution of Christians, and and these people are effectively allying with the persecuting forces of the secular government in Ukraine headed up by Zelensky. So I find it shocking. And um, yeah, I'm very interested to hear more more feedback about this and more information about it, because it does seem, you know, this is the thing with this, with this sort of, you know, anti-Ukrainian stuff that, you know, I hear a lot. Um, lo some of the time I think it, it, it lacks substance, or at least I'm, I'm, I want to know what the evidence is. I want to see evidence of what's going on. I don't just want to hear speculation. Uh, I want I want people to to link me to things where I can actually see evidence of these accusations. And and to me, this is a this is very serious. And you you can quite clearly see that this is the reality. I mean, just going through the Twitter comments there underneath the the video, you can see images of these churches that have been desecrated uh, in this persecution. So yeah, I mean, really really worrying. And um, you know, we must pray for this. We must pray for this part, this persecuted part of the body of Christ, and we must speak for them, even if it's politically um, unfashionable to do so. So there we go. Um, I'm going to leave it there pretty soon um, because I think that this episode has gone on long enough. But um, I'll do a little plug now.
I realized I probably wasn't that clear last week. So basically, um, for people who don't know, uh, this podcast, we've been doing it now for over two years and it's going really well. You know, uh, it's going really, really well. Lots of people listen to it. And uh, we have loads of people who support us as well on Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee um, financially. That's that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful thing. And it's been so encouraging. And because that support has been so forthcoming, we've been able to do loads of stuff. We've been able to make our merchandise. We've been able to do live events and everything like that. But I think arguably the most most encouraging, oh, sorry, the most exciting thing is that I've decided, we've decided together that um, I'm going to sort of start working part time on this show. So I'm taking a post and moving to a church in Winchester, Holy Trinity Winchester, uh, and that's going to be a part time post. So the church will give me a house, um, and I'll continue being being a vicar, but I'll I'll be um, working uh, in essence three days a week for the church. And the rest of the time, I'm going to uh, work on this podcast and I'm hoping to do some other stuff as well. Like I've got a book contract maybe coming up. We'll see what happens. Not no guarantees there, but I'm hoping to be able to write a book about um, Western civilization and Christianity, which I hope will be helpful to to lots of people. Uh, and yeah, I want to expand this podcast. I want to have more time. I want to have more headspace, more energy to work on it. Um, but it does it does involve it does involve. Uh, a financial challenge, which is that I will lose my income from the church. I'll still have a house. The church will still give me a house, but I'll lose my income. So I'll be relying on the income from this podcast, the income from uh, my writing and, and any other income online I'm, I'm able to do. Um, so it's 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 not absolutely critical now because really we're just trying to get um we're just trying to build up our resources so that we've got a bit of a buffer and we've got a bit of a uh, something to fall back on when when i do eventually make the move but um i do really really appreciate everyone's support for this podcast and if you like the podcast and you appreciate what we're doing um do consider becoming a supporter of this podcast and the way you can do that is you can go to our website irreverendpod Dot com and you can make a one-off contribution on buymeacoffee.com where you buy us a virtual coffee you can leave us a message um and uh, there there you can that's that's what you can do there or you can become a monthly subscriber and it's great i i love the fact that people go and buy me a coffee and i'm really grateful for it but really i'd love to see more people supporting this show um on a monthly basis now the tier system on patreon it starts very, very low. You can you can support us from one pound fifty uh, a month, and then more if you if you've got more. But what I'd like to ask you to do is just to think. Well, you know, how much do I enjoy listening to this podcast? Is this podcast worth, say, I don't know, is is each of these podcasts worth two pounds fifty? You know, and then if it is, then maybe maybe I could maybe I could give say ten pounds a month to to irreverence to keep it going and make sure that this plan of my moving and, and me working part-time on this this podcast and hopefully doing a bit more um making sure that that works um i do i do release the episodes slightly early on patreon so you do get them a bit early um and um i'm looking we're looking at um we trialed a, another another short audio podcast which we're going to uh, release to patrons only to all patrons which is called uncollared which is more of a sort of fun podcast with us just having a chat the idea is that you know we take our collars off and we have a bit of a chat and we just release that that's going to be sort of 10 10 minutes of um fun or interesting conversation so that will be just for our for our um patrons and that will be on any tier so you get that even if you just go and, and give us a pound 50 a month but just having people support us even if it's on that lowest tier having people go on there and seeing your names flash up that you've decided to support us that is such a massive encouragement and it gives us it gives us the encouragement and the the belief to keep going so please do consider supporting us even if it's for a really small amount of money go on patreon.com oh sorry go on um irreverendpod.com and click on the red button for patreon or you can go to patreon.com forward slash reverend and support us there. If you like this podcast, if you want to support us, if you want this podcast to be successful, to reach more people and to carry on, then please do do that. Do that soon um, so that we have so we can go into this next phase, which is starting in the summer uh, in the strongest possible way that we can. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, two things. Buy me a coffee, Patreon, both available on reverendpod.com. 
Um, the other thing is, I just want to give another plug for my uh, for my blog, my Substack blog, jamiefranklin.substack.com. I write about a lot of different stuff on there, um, some things to do with spirituality, lots of stuff to do with my life, uh, my family, um, family life, homeschooling, having my kids at home all the time, uh, intellectual things and things to do with uh, literature, things I'm reading, just basically anything I feel interested in at the time. Um, it's been so great to have wonderful support on there, people signing up. I released part of it for, for free, but most of it is behind a, a paywall. It's not it's not a huge paywall. It's five pounds a month uh, to receive that. And I do it. I do it every week. And they're, they're always substantial entries. And I uh, hopefully with interesting content in them. Uh, but that's another way you can support me and by implication this podcast is by going to jamiefranklin.substack.com and and subscribing to my blog which is called good things and the reason it's called good things is because i try not to fill it with really stressful political stuff but i try and fill it with things that are going to be interesting or inspiring or helpful or just wholesome in some way so uh, do do go there as well jamiefranklin.substack.com really appreciate that um thank you so much for listening now a little personal thing see as there's no one else here i'm just going to do this why not why shouldn't i just do this um i this is a personal thing and sorry if you're not interested fine but there's a there's a there's a human lesson here right um i'm a tottenham hotspur fan okay We're, they're a football club the soccer for the americans now um this week uh, our manager who has been Bit of a disaster, even though he's come with this amazing reputation, Antonio Conte. He went on this massive rant at the press conference after we drew with a uh, bottom of the table, Southampton. We were winning 3-1. They came back. We got to 3-3 and we drew. And that's a terrible result for Spurs um, for, for, for all sorts of reasons. But he went he went on this massive rant at the press conference and he was blaming the players. He was blaming the owner. He was blaming the structure of the club. He was blaming everybody else. But he was not taking responsibility himself. And that, to me, was the key. Conte came into our club. He wanted ready-made players who would win him things. And he was not prepared to coach younger players. He was not prepared to bring younger people on. He was not prepared to find solutions to the problems that he had. He played the same formation over and over again. He never changed his formation. And it got predictable. And it's boring. And people have worked how to play against it. And Spurs are not doing that well and I don't think we're playing the kind of football we should be playing with such fantastic players attacking players as, as Harry Kane and Hume and Son and players are clearly sick of this man now I think he is responsible largely responsible for how bad things are I think his attitude stinks I think the way he's trying not to take responsibility for something which clearly is his responsibility is shameful and I think it's a really really bad example particularly when you're paid 15 million pounds a year as he is to find solutions to take that responsibility and that's the thing i dislike the most about this is that i believe that you know this is going to sound patriarchal but there's no other way of saying it but i believe that it's in the essence of a man to take responsibility to Four things. You know, Apostle Paul says in the New Testament, I'm sorry, but he says, act like a man. And I think acting like a man is about taking responsibility. It's about owning up when you haven't done things properly and when things haven't been good enough and trying to put them right, not whinging and whining and blaming everyone else for your own shortcomings. It's pathetic, particularly when you're paid 15 million pounds. I mean, boo hoo. Who cares? Your contract's up in a couple of months. You can walk away. And you're still a multi-millionaire and you're in an incredibly privileged position because you've managed to make it this far and good for you for doing so. But don't tell me that it's everyone else's fault when it's actually your fault. And that kind of attitude. All right. Conte doesn't care. You know, he's made it. He's a multi-millionaire. He's massively successful. He's taken responsibility to a great extent to be able to get him there. But there's a really bad example for people who are not in such a great position, because if you go through your life not taking responsibility for things, blaming other people. Oh, it's not me, it's them. You never think about your own actions. You never think about the way that you were responsible or you are responsible. And so you don't find solutions. You don't think, well, I'm responsible. I can change this. Even if even if other people have been wrong, you know, like I'm sure the board, Daniel Levy, yeah, I'm sure they gave him false promises and said they were going to buy players and they didn't play them 
they didn't buy them and then they bought players he didn't want. Yeah, okay, maybe they're in the wrong. But that does not excuse you from taking responsibility. And that's the same thing for everyone else, all normal people as well. Yes, the world is filled with bad people, people who lie to you, people who let you down, people who do terrible things, people who will not keep their end of the bargain. Fine. And it's fine to be upset about that. It's fine to be upset about that kind of thing happening to you and to be hurt by it and be wounded by it. But don't allow that hurt and that woundedness to translate into the adopting the status of a victim and not reflecting on the part that you had to play in the problem that was caused. Because most of the time, we are not innocent victims. Most of the time, we have done things, we have contributed, and there are things that we can learn about our own behavior, particularly in this instance, which is a silly one because it's just about football. But it's true in life in general. It really, really is. And it's a good message, I think, particularly for young men. Take responsibility for your actions. Stop blaming other people. Pathetic. And if you spend your whole life doing it, no one will respect you. And they'll think you're an idiot. They won't want any time for you. But they won't have any time for you. But if you take responsibility for your actions, if you take responsibility, even in a situation where people wouldn't necessarily expect you to, you will grow, you will develop, you will be a respectable man. And that's what I conclude, having looked at this shameful, infantile outburst by this multimillionaire failure of a manager, Antonio Conte. And I don't like him slagging off our club either. You were meant to be there to improve the damn club, not to blow it up because of your petulance and your pathetic attempt to excuse yourself from any kind of responsibility from what's happened. Don't come into our club, accept £15 million pounds from it and slag off the entire institution and by implication, the supporters. I don't like that. Spurs fans do not like that. And now you've alienated all of them and you've alienated all of the players and you've alienated all of the club's hierarchy. Your legacy is tarnished now forever. So anyway, just a little reflection. If you'd like more of these reflections, uh, do let me know because I, you know, I can provide them. I do like letting off a bit of steam every now and again in the appropriate context. Send me an email, irreverentpod at gmail.com or just put a comment uh, under the YouTube video or a telegram, which you can join, by the way, if you're not on our telegram, t.me forward slash irreverent. Just do that. I feel like I should say a prayer. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we give you thanks for your goodness to us, for your providential hand which rules over this universe. I thank you that you call us to lives filled with meaningful good works, that you heal us of all our wounds, and that you strengthen us for your service. Bless all who listen to this podcast. Draw them close to you. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. All right, friends, I enjoyed that. See you again next time.